Louis Katz. 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 When I first started doing stand-up comedy in San Francisco, Louis Katz was already a local legend. When I first met him, he was a young kid. I can't even tell you how much potential this guy. He was a joke writer. This guy put the work in. I think Louis is extremely funny. I've known Louis for a long time. I love Louis. Oh my God, he was. So, so funny. He's a very good joke writer, he's very funny. So well written, as, as well written as an act he can get. I love his act because it's like super dirty, but also super smart. It's just he puts in a ton of work and it really shows. So Louis is as good as it gets. He's a great comic and, and I don't know why he's not further along with his career. So I brought him out on the road. I figured, you know, like he'll open for me for now. That's temporary. He'll be headlining before you know it. 15 years later, um, he's still opening for me. I thought he was gonna be huge, and he is huge in my heart. Why is Louis not more famous? Oof. You know, I don't know. Louis certainly thinks he should have blown up. Why is he not more famous? Implies that he's famous even a little bit. I mean, he's kind of thought he should have blown up from the first moment I met him when he just started doing comedy. More famous. Not at all famous. Nobody's more confused about the fact that Louis Katz hasn't blown up than him. Probably has something to do with the, you know, the regular stuff, hairline. He's short. If I could put it in a word, it begins with P, and that's personality. Really quite unpleasant to look at. You know, Louis says things that are just very, just dirty, and it's, you're sitting there and you're like, your family's sitting there in the front row. They're the only people at the show. Louis, why don't you just accept the fact that you're a brilliant middle act. This comedy thing, it's a tough game. No one me too's a middle act. It's a coin toss. Oh yeah, I went home with the, you know, the one in between the two and the... You don't know what people really want to see, but I guess as we can tell, they don't want to see him. I don't remember his name, but he was very pushy about a hand job. He's just one of those comics who's a great comic, but should have been a writer, but instead decided to, you know, just keep trying. And so here we are, watching him try again. I love him, but a lot of factors. That's his train that's coming. It's a train that's taking Louis to success, and he's nowhere around. But maybe this special will be the thing that brings him to the next level, you know? Co-headlining. You know what? You will love this special. Give it a chance. Enjoy a, another special that very few people are going to watch. Charge that iPhone 4 and finish this special because you won't regret it. I've been having some problems in the bedroom with my lady. <laughs> but we've been talking it through and we decided, you know, maybe we're a little too vanilla. Got to start pushing our boundaries a little bit, you know, experiment. And we decided to do that. We decided to try something neither of us had tried before. Uh, a little something called doggy style. <laughs> okay, a few people familiar. Doggy style, that's where she uh, tricks me into going down on her by putting peanut butter on her pussy. <laughs> Doggy style. Sorry, we got a peanut allergy up here. I'm sorry, dude. I don't mean... I wrote that joke in March 2020. I had to wait a whole year to tell that stupid-ass joke. Twelve months of that bullshit rattling around in my head, man. It was really tough on me going that year without comedy, man, because my, my friends, they all got husbands, wives, kids. I got jokes. That's it. <laughs> Because I'm the single one of the crew, whenever they do get married, they turn to me to plan their bachelor parties. I got all the qualifications. I'm single, I'm sleazy, and I'm organized. That's what it takes. <laughs> you wanna plan a bachelor party, you better know your way around a strip club and a spreadsheet. <laughs> it's a weird tradition, right? The bachelor party, when you think about it, basically you're celebrating somebody getting married by coming very close to just ruining that marriage. <laughs> It's kind of like celebrating getting a new job by sending a racist tweet. <laughs> or the time my parents celebrated having a son by chopping off just a little bit of my penis. <laughs> Last bachelor party I planned was the toughest of all of them uh, because my friend who was getting married, uh, he is gay. That's not the problem. The problem was me and all of his other friends, we were all straight. 
we were the problem. <laughs> because of us, I just wasn't sure what kind of entertainment I was supposed to arrange. I asked a female friend of mine for some advice. She was like, oh, maybe you can plan like a, like a scavenger hunt. Uh, he's not that gay. <laughs> no, we're gonna need a male stripper. It just has to be the right male stripper. You know, I'm thinking seven to 10 inches of dick. <laughs> That's gonna make all the straight guys sad. But 11 inches and up, I mean, that's exciting for everybody, you know? Uh, that crosses the line from stripper to medical curiosity. You don't gotta dance, how about you have a Q and A? Cause I've got some questions. Uh, like what's it like having sex with part of it on the outside, huh? What's that like? You ever catch a breeze on your dick neck, get chilly? Use a scrunchie like the world's smallest infinity scarf? You ever tuck up between your legs and pee backwards while walking forwards, huh? You ever do that? That's what I would do, man. Big dick be wasted on me. I just use it for parlor tricks and whatnot. I really thought I'd, uh, I'd be married by now, but I am not. Whatever, it's okay. I'm not trying to worry about that. Really what I'm trying to do now is just focus on living in the present. That's what everyone says is the key to happiness. You just gotta be in the present. We're working really hard on living in the present. So far, not a fan. I don't like the present. I think the present is vastly overrated. You know, the only time I really like living now in the present was back when I was younger and living in the past. Because back then it wasn't the present, it was the future. And the future of my past was way better than the present that future became. <laughs> Look, all I'm saying is if you made a ranking of the greatest times of all time, number one, future, because so much potential, anything's possible. Number two, past, because that's when you got the most future. And number three, dead last, the present. Fucking sucks. <laughs> Here, I'll prove it to you. Let's think back before the show, when you're living in the future. You're like, oh man, I bet this show's gonna be pretty good. After the show's over, you'll be living in the past. Forget this part, be like, man, that show wasn't bad at all. <laughs> but right now in the present, most of you don't know what the fuck I'm talking about. <laughs> oh man, the only way I'm living in the present is if it starts living up to the potential I had in my younger days. And hopefully this special will make that happen, man. I got a lot riding on this. Yeah. I hope it goes good. <laughs> Thank you. Seriously, I've, I've been working on so many jokes for this thing, but the thing is, these days, people don't want a special that's just jokes. It has to be more than jokes if it's to be considered a real work of art. You know what people like from a special? They like a special where, like, the comedian, like, bears their soul, you know, reveals their inner demons. And you know they're about to do it because the camera starts coming in real tight. <laughs> And all of a sudden their voice changes. <laughs> they sound like a total different comedian. Right? All of a sudden it doesn't sound like a comedy show. It sounds like you're listening to a story on NPR <laughs> about how a man with no limbs learned to write opera with his eyebrows. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not that kind of comedian. I don't know, I'm in therapy. Does that help? Is that good? <laughs> it took me a while to go to therapy, man. I was just uh, kind of scared of therapy. But you know what going to therapy is like? Going to therapy is just like watching an episode of Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Therapist is trying to solve the mystery of your haunted head. <laughs> At the end of every session, they rip the mask off the monster reveal, ah, it was your parents the whole time. <laughs> Zoinks, that'll be 200 bucks. <laughs> That's gotta be one of the worst parts of having kids, right? No matter how good you do, you knock it out of the park, you're still gonna mess that kid up somehow. Right? My parents were great, very loving, very supportive. That's what fucked me up. <laughs> Love and support, that doesn't prepare you for life. <laughs> Love and support, I feel like I was training for the Special Olympics, all of a sudden I turned 18, like, oh shit, I'm in the real Olympics. <laughs> now I gotta run a marathon and all my training was hugs and piggyback rides. You know, another thing that, that stopped me from going to therapy for a long time, I thought it was too much 
of a Jewish stereotype. I'm Jewish, in case you couldn't tell from the name and face. <laughs> and to me, it's so stereotypical, right? A Jew in therapy. Then I go to therapy. Turns out uh, I got a thing called Jewish guilt, which is another stereotype. So basically, I got two stereotypes for the price of one, which is a great deal and a third stereotype. <laughs> Generally, I do try to avoid stereotypes in my act. It's one of the few jokes that I, I don't like. I find stereotype jokes offensive. Not because they're bigoted, I just think they're kind of hacky. They're played out, right? Because you know what a stereotype really is? It's just a joke that we've all heard so many times that we all know it already, right? You want to make a funny observation about a group, fine, but give me something new, something original. Here, let's take a random stereotype, for example. Let's say uh, 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 black people love fried chicken, right? First of all, heard it before, a million times. Second of all, guess what? Everyone loves fried chicken. <laughs> How about this instead? Black men over 60 love single ear Bluetooth headsets. <laughs> Not quite as catchy. I'll, I'll try to explain to all of you uh, uh, a little more about Jewish guilt. I'll give you a Jewish guilt example for those of you not familiar. One time I'm coming home to visit my folks. I come in, my dad's sitting on the couch. Sitting next to him on the couch is a small person crudely carved out of wood. Strange. I said, Dad, what is that? He goes, oh, that's my new son because you don't visit me enough anymore. Instead of just asking me to visit, fucking Jew pedo over here has got me competing with my new puppet stepbrother. Puppet stepbrother, man. It doesn't seem like we're just a few years away from that being a genre on Pornhub. <laughs> uh, you know, it's weird uh, every time I go back to visit my folks, because they live in the same house I grew up in. That's always a trip, right? Staying in that same house, so many memories. A at one point, uh, when I was staying at that house, I found myself masturbating in the very same bathroom where I first masturbated. <laughs> many years before. When I finished, I actually said out loud, this is where it all started. <laughs> like some kind of noir detective trying to crack the case of my wasted potential. <laughs> no, I'm sure my parents really wish uh, I had a, a kid by now. They want a grandkid. And at this point, I'm not sure if I want them. Having a kid would go against my no new people policy. <laughs> I'm done meeting new people, baby or adult, I'm good. <laughs> Aren't those the worst kind of people, new people? It's like, oh, let me take a wild guess. You were born somewhere and now you do something. <laughs> Fucking fascinating. <laughs> anyway, I'm just trying to be um, more positive in general. That's some advice I got from my therapist. Uh, I'm always trying to be more positive. Does not come naturally to me. I'm not a very positive person. I, I think it's part of living in a big city for a long time, right? When you live in a big city, someone who's overly positive starts to be a little bit suspicious. <laughs> a certain level of politeness and niceness in a city is acceptable. Once you cross the line, it's like, hey man, what are you up to? <laughs> right? Offer me directions, fine, but hey, I'm going that way. I'll walk with you. Mm, no, you won't. <laughs> Someone who's overly nice like that means one of two things to me. Either used to be way into drugs or currently way into God. Either way, I don't want to go to your meetings. <laughs> Religious people are always super positive, man. They have, they have good reason to be so positive, you know, because anything bad happens and you're religious, you're like, hey, that's fine. It's all part of God's plan. I'm looking around at all the crazy stuff happening in the world. I'm like, man, I'm starting to think God not the best at making plans. <laughs> Typical creative type, kind of all over the place. <laughs> you want proof that God's not good at making plans? How about the fact that God always wants to meet up early on a Sunday? <laughs> right? And you always gotta go to God's house. If God was really good at making plans, God would be like, hear me now for I am the Lord. Man, you were tore up last night. Look, just text me when you get up. I'm gonna go over to your place. I'm gonna make you an omelet and some mimosas. 
be like, oh man, thank God you are my savior. <laughs> to me, it doesn't feel like uh, God has a, has a plan for us. If anything, it feels like maybe God is pulling pranks on us. <laughs> That's what it feels like to me. And man, I don't like pranks. It's, it's another kind of joke that I really don't like is the prank. Because first of all, they're cruel. But second of all, what really bothers me about a prank is they show a lack of patience, right? Because what is a prank really? You're just going out of your way to make something horrible happen to somebody. Guess what? Just wait a while. <laughs> God's got a plan for that. There's no prank you could pull that could outdo the prank that is life. What, what do you think you could do? Put a, put a fake snake in a guy's car? Why bother? There's already a real snake in his book club. His name's Pablo, and he's banging his wife. All right? That's all of life, just a series of pranks, one after another, right? From the very first day you're born. Spend nine months inside of a woman, spend the rest of your life trying to get back in one. Prank. <laughs> Tooth Fairy, prank. Santa Claus, prank. Your parents' marriage, prank. Oh, you, you like how that tastes? Oh, well, now you got diabetes, prank. Oh, you like how that tastes? Well, now you got herpes, prank. Monogamy, prank. Democracy, prank. Every Star Wars after the trilogy, prank. There's a cure, but you can't afford it, prank. Life goes on, but you never get over it, prank. You get diarrhea but you never get how to spell it. Prank. <laughs> no, the key to life is to expect disappointment. And then you can be pleasantly surprised when every once in a while, things actually turn out in your favor. And that is the power of negative thinking. <laughs> That's right. It can work for you too. Just follow the ABCs of negativity. A, always expect the worst. B because you're gonna die. See, come on, just give up already. You know, 100% of failures start with trying. It's true. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to be more positive. I am. It's hard to be positive and optimistic as you get older. You know what I mean? It's just a fact. You are running out of future and hitting that potential starts to become less and less likely. You know, anything's possible starts turning into, ah, it's possible you won't do anything. <laughs> and I, it would be great if I could ignore getting older, but I can't, I can, I can just tell it's happening. Everything's changing. All of a sudden I started fearing skateboarders and appreciating the clarinet. <laughs> you know what I started doing? I started buying drugs from a doctor. <laughs> I don't like that. I prefer a good old fashioned drug dealer. Right, because doctors are always asking very personal, invasive questions. Drug dealer never does that. Drug dealers never like, uh, so you mentioned in your text you'd like in a eight ball of cocaine, what seems to be the problem? Uh, well, sometimes I drink so much that I feel like I shouldn't drive anymore and I'd like to fix that. You guys all get it. These guys are like, I bike everywhere, I don't know. <laughs> I don't, I don't party like that anymore. That's part of getting older. Can't do coke anymore. Used to do shrooms, can't do shrooms anymore. Now if I want to experience an alternate reality, I just switch back and forth real fast between Fox and MSNBC. <laughs> no, the last new drug I tried, hemorrhoid cream. <laughs> just bought my first tube the other day. <laughs> Which, don't get me wrong, I've had hemorrhoids for decades. I just finally decided to go out and buy that cream. <laughs> Up to then, I just didn't know what it was. I was like, oh man, when I eat too much spicy food, my asshole gets blown out. <laughs> Hope that goes away. <laughs> I was like, man, maybe there's a remedy for this <laughs> and a proper medical term besides blown out asshole. <laughs> It's also scary getting older when you do this job. Believe it or not, stand-up comedy does not have a great retirement plan. <laughs> Our only benefit is sometimes the club gives us free chicken wings. I guess if I could collect enough of those bones, I could build myself a retirement cabin. <laughs> Live like some kind of mini chicken warlord. 
But it's scary getting older because we really don't do a good job of taking care of seniors in this country, right? I think we can do better by our old folk here. Here's what I say we do. I say we round up all our seniors, send them to a tropical island. A beautiful tropical island where they can't vote. <laughs> you know, like Puerto Rico. <laughs> but we don't just leave them there to fend for themselves. No, we have people waiting on them, hand and foot, 24 seven. And that's where the child molesters come in. <laughs> All right, a couple people share my vision. The rest of you hear me out. I'll round them all up, send them to old person slash child molester island. Or as we'll call in the brochure, Florida 2. <laughs> right? It's the perfect ironic punishment for these pedophiles. Oh, you like them young? Well, are you gonna get super fucking old? <laughs> and think how great this is for our seniors. Finally, someone who's actually sincerely interested in seeing pictures of their grandkids. <laughs> Thank you. That's right, I think I just solved every problem. You're welcome. I mean, look, getting older sucks, but I think as long as you're hitting those marks, reaching the potential you thought you had, you know, it's okay. But my life is not where I hoped it would be. Like, I recently went through a breakup, same week as my 40th birthday. Yeah, that one you're right to owe. That's right, yeah. That one hits the crowd hard, you know? I don't think the breakup as much as now that you just know I'm in my 40s. <laughs> no one wants to hear that. I tell the crowd I'm in my 40s, they're like, hey man, we're just here to have a good time, please. <laughs> Got any more pedophile jokes or something like that? <laughs> yeah, the timing of that breakup though, that really messed me up, man. I, I just didn't picture my life like that. I never thought I'd be 40 years old and breaking up with my girlfriend. You know, I really thought by then I'd be like, divorcing my wife. <laughs> Turns out, gotta have your shit together for it to fall apart. <laughs> I mean, I thought I'd be fighting over custody, trying to keep the house. Instead, I was just like, ah, the bitch took the Roku. <laughs> but it, it was, it's better that we broke up, man. It, the relationship was bad for a while. You could tell the relationship starting to turn sour when the pet names start to change. When we first started dating, we were so in love, so sweet to each other, right? It's like, hey, cutie. Hi, baby. Then towards the end, it was more like, well, well, well. If it isn't garbage dick, the hummus hog. And that's when you know it's over. When she uses your wizard name. The breakup kind of messed me up though, man, because I really thought this woman had the potential to be the one. First of all, she was beautiful which I've since learned is a horrible mistake. <laughs> Never date the beautiful, it clouds your vision. Right, four years, I thought this woman was so fascinating. Turns out, she's just symmetrical. <laughs> My new rule is, if she ain't busted, I don't trust it. <laughs> Not only was she beautiful, but she was also the very first Jew I ever dated, which I don't usually care about that, but when you're Jewish, it's ingrained in your head from the time you're real little. All your relatives are like, you gotta date a Jewish girl, so you marry a Jewish girl and have Jewish children. It's essential to the survival of our people. It's like, all right, I get it. Gotta keep the race pure. That's always worked out well for the Jews. <laughs> that's a mistake, because mixing, that's where it's at, right? <laughs> Mixing's the, the best. That's how we all get along better. That's how we get better looking people. Everyone knows that by now, mixed race people, best looking people in the world. Seriously, at this point, if you're mixed race and ugly, it's like, man, I, I guess that's on you. <laughs> you want proof that mixing makes people look better? All you gotta do is compare an American Jew, like myself, with an Israeli. Just look at us side by side, you'd be like, how are you two even fucking related? Because <laughs> Israelis, they're beautiful. That's, that's like a, prime cut Jew right there. You know what I mean? Just like bronze, buff, Uzi in one hand, falafel in the other. <laughs> they're hot. Why are they so hot? Because they're Jews, but they're mixed. They're mixed with Spanish, with Portuguese, with Moroccan, with Iraqi. You know what American Jews are mixed with? Yeah, the same 50 pasty, fiddle-playing motherfuckers <laughs> from a small Polish village for a thousand years. That's why we look like every short character from Lord of the Rings combined. 
if you're lucky, great grandma got raped by a Cossack, you got green eyes. It's like the best case scenario. She was not only was she the, the first Jew I ever dated, first white woman I ever dated. And that, I mean, very exotic. <laughs> I don't know if anyone here has ever been with a white woman before. <laughs> I know it's a bit taboo. <laughs> but it really opened me up to new things sexually really made me learn to appreciate like a nice, flat, wide ass. You know what I'm saying? You know, just flat and wide like Kansas, you know? Uh, a Kansas ass, if you will. You know? It's still a bubble butt, but it's like one of those long bubbles the creepy guy in the park makes with a rope, like one of those. Like... By the way, I want to make it very clear that is a pro white woman joke, okay? I know you guys have had a tough couple of years. I, I, sincerely, I don't want to add to your trauma, okay? Look, I, I love white women. Such an intoxicating mix of victimhood and privilege, you know? They're like the Jews of gender. Yeah, man, it wasn't just that my ex was, uh, was uh, beautiful and Jewish. She was also a big activist. I love that, man. She was this huge feminist. But it, she was kind of one of those new school feminists, so it was kind of hard for me to understand her ideology. Right? She's one of these feminists who, like, hates workplace harassment, but fucked everyone she worked with. <laughs> I guess you're going to smash the patriarchy one patriarch at a time. <laughs> and two at a time that one time. <laughs> That actually happened before uh, we were together. I didn't mind that she had a sexual past. I just wish she had more of a sexual present. <laughs> when we were together, it felt like, uh, I don't know, my sex drive was way higher than hers. Like in the bedroom, I felt sometimes like some kind of a sex auctioneer, just trying to bargain down for any possible sex act <laughs> I could get her to agree with. Right, like, all right, here we go. Uh, can I get a fuck one fuck one time real quick? Just a tip, just a tip, just a tip. Can I get a blow job? How about a hand job? How about I do it myself while I say a tits job? Going once, going twice. So the man masturbated by himself in the bathroom. <laughs> so yeah, man, I guess she had a higher sex drive before we were together, but I just figured, you know, over time, People change, no big deal. She doesn't want sex anymore. Then she suggested we start having an uh, open relationship. And I was like, oh, it's not that she doesn't want sex anymore. She doesn't want me anymore. <laughs> that's exciting, right? Because that's the good thing about an open relationship. You get to feel all those feelings that you don't get to feel when you're in a relationship. And she told me that, I was like, oh wow, I haven't felt rejection in a while. This is great. <laughs> Anyone here in an open relationship? Oh no, that. That's great, seriously, because I've been taping all these shows for years. I'm gonna make a mega mix of all those silences, send them to her. <laughs> this, is what, this is what everyone thinks of your dumb idea. And I don't know what it is though. Like the girl before her cheated on me. She wanted an open relationship. I guess there's just something about me that attracts women to other men. <laughs> she really tried to, uh, to uh, sell me hard on opening up the relationship. She was pitching it, man. She's like, you know, if we had an open relationship, you could have sex with as many women as you want. Uh, no, I couldn't. <laughs> You're trying to sell an open relationship to a short, bald man? Fuck you. <laughs> That's rude as hell. <laughs> the only thing I think we could have done is if we went out as a team, like swingers. That seems fun, right? Woo! Especially if we're gonna break up anyway. That's gotta be the best way to break up. You know what I'm saying? Just go out with a gangbang? 
the more I thought about it, I was like, man, I think I was too emotionally invested at the time. It's not a good look being the only crying guy at the orgy. It's <laughs> like, ah, ah, ah. I'm good. I'm good. I just got a little jizz in my eye. I'm okay. Whatever, she's gone. I still got jokes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, guys. That's it. Thank you. I appreciate it. But that's the thing, though. People don't want jokes anymore. Man. They want more than jokes from a special. You know what people like? They love these preachy comedians, right? These comedians that share their opinions about all the problems of the world. Well, I think one of the biggest problems of the world is that everyone feels the need to share their opinions with everyone else. <laughs> yeah. And that's just something I wanted to share with all of you. <laughs> Plenty of problems to talk about these days, man. Our, our country is uh, also struggling to live up to its potential, <laughs> so I can relate. <laughs> We're a very divided country, right? We don't agree on anything. Even the stuff that all Americans agree on, we don't agree on in exactly the same way. Like, all Americans believe in freedom, but it's different freedom depending on where you live. Right, like red states love freedom via loophole. Right? Anyone big to like the, the deep south where they got these riverboat casinos? Oh, you have, if, you guys, you have to check out a riverboat casino. These riverboat casinos are amazing. Basically, these are states that have decided, hey, gambling is wrong and immoral on land. <laughs> totally cool on a boat. Makes you want to open a cockfight gondola. Then blue states, on the other hand, very clear and direct about their freedom, but their priorities are all out of whack. Like in California, marijuana, 100% completely legal, right? California's amazing like that. Anyone can buy weed, but no one can buy a house. <laughs> and then on the other hand, you got red states like Texas, where no one can get an abortion, but anyone can get a gun. So technically, anyone can get an abortion. <laughs> Just have to find that loophole, wait till after the baby's born, and then claim self-defense. Hey man, that baby was crawling right at me. Drooling at the side of his mouth, I swear it was on something. Look, you can't come another man's house, start sucking his wife's titties, it ain't right. At least we got legal weed, I guess. Right, that's exciting. I don't even smoke weed, but I still like going to dispensary just to feel free. <laughs> Last time I was there, I actually did end up picking something up. I saw something I'd never seen before. They had weed lube. Yeah, marijuana lubricants. This is amazing. If you haven't tried it, you gotta try it. I'm not making this up for the act. It is very real, and it really works. Yeah, that's right, it made that pussy paranoid. <laughs> I thought I was in for a nice romantic evening. Next thing I know, my lady just starts queefing conspiracy theories. <laughs> Epstein. <laughs> QAnon. <laughs> the Jews control the labia. <laughs> it was always my dream to move to New York, become a stand-up comedian. I've been living there for a while, and New York is uh, all right. Uh, <laughs> New York's kind of like just riding off the reputation of how great it once was. It's kind of like uh, this whole country. Uh, <laughs> like, living in New York now is kind of like meeting a supermodel in their 80s. Uh, I guess this is cool. Uh, got any pictures from before? just gone kind of soft, man. And that's not what New York's supposed to be. It's supposed to be hard, tough, grimy. It's not like that anymore. Like recently, there was a huge controversy in my neighborhood in Brooklyn. Everyone's super upset because someone opened a hip hop yoga studio and all the teachers there are all white people. It's like, I'm sorry, were you hoping for a more authentic 
hip hop yoga experience? I mean, of course, all those teachers are white people, right? Sure, it's a mix of two brown people traditions, but it's also a mix of two white people traditions, right? That's making money and stealing brown people's traditions. I mean, besides, only a white person would have the vision to see hip hop and yoga and go, you know what? I I'm gonna ruin these both. <laughs> that's right, hip hop might be black, yoga might be brown, but hip hop yoga, that's whiter than a thousand dollar veterinary bill. <laughs> it's very white. So yeah, man, New York's gone soft, but, but don't worry, there's some of the old New York still there. It's still incredibly dangerous and also super expensive. What a town. <laughs> There was used actually uh, recently a shooting uh, right in my neighborhood. Um, very scary. I decided, you know, it's time. I got to invest in a high-tech security system. So I went out and bought a bat. <laughs> Only after I brought it home did I realize, oh, my apartment is not big enough to swing a bat. <laughs> Burglar breaks into my place. I wind up to hit him, end up smashing my TV. <laughs> I guess you won't be stealing that now, will you, bitch? <laughs> now get out before you get bunted. <laughs> the shooting was scary, man. I was home when it happened. 1 p.m., middle of the day. I hear all this gunfire. I lay low for a little while. Then uh, when I think the coast is clear, I go outside to see what happened. Turns out, right across from my building, all these cops standing there. I asked one of the officers what happened. He broke it down for me. He said, basically what happened was, one dude had beef with another dude. So then he shot and killed just that dude. Right? Isn't that crazy? Didn't shoot up a movie theater. Didn't fuck up the concert for everybody. Just shot one guy. Yeah, I didn't know they still made shootings a la carte. <laughs> Leave it to Brooklyn to come up with some nice artisanal small batch gun violence. None of that mass-produced bullshit. <laughs> well, these mass shootings are scary, man, but the good news is mass shootings up, serial killings way down. Why? They can't compete. <laughs> Finally, the market is working in our favor. Oh, I pity these poor serial killers. Can't you just picture them sitting in their self-dug dungeons, watch the news super pissed off? Like, really? 36 kills in five minutes? Uh, back in my day, I had to walk 10 miles uphill through the snow just to dismember one prostitute. I spent years learning taxidermy, going to clown school. This is disgusting. They're, they're not even taking the time to have sex with the corpses. I, uh, one thing that New York still has going for it that I think is great about the town, very diverse. And I love that. There's such an interesting mix of people there. My, my building in Brooklyn, only four units, but you get a little bit of everybody. This is how it breaks down. First floor, Latino gentleman. Second floor, black trans lady. Third floor, Jewish comedian. Top floor, semi-blind, albino Muslim lady. Yeah. It's, a, it's a real Klansman's buffet. It's almost as if they made everyone from the cover of the college brochure live together after they graduated. And that is for very different people, but we all get along pretty well, except for the black trans lady. She's always getting in fights with everyone in the building. Uh, her name is Ellen Allen. I know it sounds like a name I made up. Look, I did not make that name up, okay? She made it up. <laughs> but Ellen Allen's got beef with everybody that lives there, but especially me, because I live right above her. So she's always banging on my door, complaining about noise when I'm sitting quietly on the couch reading a book, threatening to stab my friend. You know, every Jew on the door, they get a little box with a prayer in it. It's called a mezuzah. Every Jew has one, except for me, because Ellen Allen fucking stole mine. <laughs> yeah, you realize how messed up that is? I got hate crimed by the world's most hate crimeable person. And I feel bad because I know how tough it is for people like her, but I don't hate trans people, I hate trans person. It's very specific. 
But still, I can't help but feel guilty about it because, you know, the trials and tribulations of folks like her. Like, you know, trans women of color are 4.3 times more likely to be victims of homicide. And just last year alone, 18 trans women of color were murdered. And the worst part is, none of them were Ellen Allen. I hope that bitch <laughs> fucking dies. I hope she fucking dies. I don't care what bathroom she uses as long as she slips and cracks her head on the goddamn tile. I don't know. I think, I think it's taken a while for uh, people to uh, get used to trans people. And I, I think it's because uh, it's human nature to be uncomfortable with something they can't, like, categorize easily. People want to put people in little boxes, pigeonhole them. And looking back through life, I realized this was happening the whole time, and I didn't even notice it. Like, when I was in school, there was this kid, white kid, who loved hip-hop. So everyone made fun of him, said he acted black, called him a wigger. Right? I think maybe... One person remembers that, and the rest of you are like, uh, I don't think you're allowed to say that anymore. I don't think. What am I supposed to say, the W word? No one will know what I'm talking about. Sorry, it's a fact from the past. How else am I supposed to talk about it? And Wiggers have played an important part in American history, from John Brown to Eminem. So he was white, but acted black, so people called him a Wigger. Then I had another kid at my school, a good friend of mine, straight guy, straight man, but acted uh, uh, gay. So people made fun of him. Uh, now, today, he self-identifies as queer, which still kind of sounds like a slur to me, but definitely way better than Stragget. <laughs> but no, I know, I know it's going to get better for people of different uh, gender identities and sexualities. It's got to. It's their time. Because straight men's time is clearly up. We are done, and we deserve it. Come on, let's be honest, we deserve it. Men, we have not been behaving very well. And some people will argue with you about it, like, oh, it's, it's not all men, it's just these, uh, these sexual predators, these guys who aggressively pursue sex. Sounds like all men. <laughs> right? Any guy out on the town on a Saturday night is a sexual predator. <laughs> I, I, mean, I mean, not me, you know. I'm a little different. I'm more of a sexual scavenger. <laughs> These other guys are prowling like wolves. I swoop in vulture style, like, you gonna finish that? Yeah, all right. Sorry to bother you. All right. I'll just circle back. Man, no one's ever made vulture noises to the vulture style joke. That's the first. I'm glad we got it on tape. I don't know, the only way men are gonna survive is if we start uh, learning more from women. I've been, I've been doing my own part. I, uh, recently I started uh, peeing sitting down. <laughs> it's a baby step, but it's a step nonetheless. Any other guys in here pee sitting down? Yeah, yeah over there in the back. I think you pee passed out in an alley. That's how I think you pee. <laughs> how long have you been doing it vagina style? Oh, God, 25 years. Damn, wow, a veteran of the game. Salute. Because <laughs> that's way advanced, man. It took me a long time to start doing that. It is so much better. I'm going to convert all you guys in here tonight. Seriously. It's the best. You get to sit down. So relaxing. Don't make a mess in front of the toilet. No drippage inside of your pants. And to me, this is the best part. Because I'm sitting down so much more throughout the day, now I'm taking all these random little shits. <laughs> That's right, I'm microducing. <laughs> I think men can also learn a lot uh, from women when it comes to communication. I have some kind of classic male communication issues. I've got this thing where a, a woman, maybe a girlfriend of mine, comes to me with a problem of hers, and me, like a big dumb man, I try and solve that problem. And this is a, a classic male mistake, because a lot of times women don't want you to solve the problem they told you about. They don't want you to fix it. All they want is to be heard, you know, right? Yeah. And, and, and men have been making this mistake for centuries. Like, you know, Thomas Edison's wife told him that she had trouble reading at night. 
And that's why he invented the light bulb? What an asshole. How about a little less electricity and a little more listening, Thomas? Great, now we can all see at night. But you never really saw her. One of the clearest uh, signs of the decline of men is the uh, rise of the vibrator. Every, yeah, right, every woman has a vibrator by now. Cla clap if you're a woman in here who does not have a vibrator. Wow. I mean, what are we even doing here anymore, guys? I'm surprised dudes aren't just marching in front of sex shops with tiki torches. Like, you will not replace us. I didn't feel that way at first. At first, I, I thought the, me and the vibrator, we're, we're on the same side. Right? It's kind of like me and the vibrator, like, like we're in a band together. Right? I'm holding down on bass. Vibrator just rocking out on lead guitar. But then after a while, it felt more like Vibrator was rocking out on lead guitar. And I was just off in the corner playing the maracas. You know, just <laughs> totally expendable. You know, they say porn sets unachievable standards for sex. What about the Vibrator, huh? How was anybody supposed to compete with the Vibrator? I've tried, I've tried my best, okay? That's my best. That's as good as I can do. <laughs> You want me to compete with the vibrator? You'll have to tase me while I'm fingering it. <laughs> the clearest sign that men's time is over is uh, all this abortion stuff going on right now. As we can see, men just grasping for control when they've clearly lost it. And I know people might feel different ways about the issue in here, but then the way I look at it, doesn't matter how you feel about it personally, doesn't even matter if they make it illegal. Bottom line is people always find a way. In fact, I think I found a way. Check this out. Riverboat abortion clinics. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing helps an abortion go down smooth like some live in Dixieland jazz. <laughs> I hear babies crying. Those are my jokes about the problem of the world. But these days, people want more than jokes. You know what I'm saying? You know what they really want? They like a comedian who reveals like a deep, dark secret, right? You can tell they're about to reveal it because maybe the camera comes in again. <laughs> Real close. And maybe they, I don't know, I don't know, maybe they uh, sit down on a stool as if the secret itself is... Too much to bear. <laughs> then they start making all these dramatic. <laughs> pauses. <laughs> as if they're not sure they want to reveal. Something they've clearly rehearsed. <laughs> and paid a camera crew to film. <laughs> All right, here's a secret for you guys. Don't tell anybody. Right? I'm not in therapy because of my parents. I'm not in therapy because of my ex. I'm in therapy because of this fucking job, okay? <laughs> Stand-up comedy is driving me crazy. And I got so many jokes, tons of jokes. You know what I don't got? An agent, a manager, a fan base, or any more headlining gigs on my calendar for the rest of the year, okay? Look, my career is proof that Jews don't control the media. <laughs> my, my, my ex rejecting me is one thing, you know, because I can break up with her, find a new woman. I can't break up with comedy. What am I gonna do? Go on a dating app for performing arts careers? Start flirting with clowning? Not an option. <laughs> and your guys' laughs tell me I'm great, and my empty calendar tells me, yeah, you should have gone to grad school. <laughs> and I'm honestly not sure which one is right. And it's not just a money thing, right? I mean, it would be nice to make more money, but really, the thing that hurts me is not having more gigs is stopping me from becoming a better comedian. And that's all I want, is just become the best comedian I could possibly be. It's like, you can't practice stand-up comedy alone in a garage, like if you were in a band or if you had a vibrator. 
no, you need live audiences like this. And the more gigs I get, the longer sets I get, the better I get as a comedian, the more I grow as a comedian, the closer I get to reaching my potential. It's kind of like, it's like you know how a, uh, they say a lizard will only get as big as his tank? Well, I feel like I'm an iguana and I'm pressed up right against the glass. <laughs> And I just know if I had a bigger aquarium, this iguana could be Godzilla. Or, or, or maybe just a like, slightly bigger iguana, you know? Uh, you know? The kind you see in Florida one. <laughs> and the worst part about it is I'm pressed up against the glass and right across the way I can see this little tiny gecko in an aquarium the size of an arena. Like, why does that gecko get all that space? Turns out that gecko has a very successful podcast. <laughs> but the thing is, I don't want a podcast, man. All I want is to tell these jokes. This is what I do. This is my art form, you know? Poets write poems. Painters paint paintings. I'm a comedian. I tell jokes, all right? And it, it's, it's like I tried to explain to my ex when we got in this big argument about some of the things in my act. I said to her, look, like, if I was a singer, I would write a song about you. And I'll never forget, she looked me right in the eyes and she said, Louie, no one writes songs about how their girlfriend's pussy smells like cat food. <laughs> I said, well, what do you think Cats in the Cradle was about? <laughs> and she goes, a workaholic performer who loses sight of what's important in life? I said, well, that's the cool thing about art. It's open to interpretation. <laughs> and that's the cool thing about jokes, too. They're open to interpretation, right? A podcast host tells you what to think. These preachy comedians, they tell you what to think. A really great joke, it makes you think and laugh at the same time. And when the world keeps hitting us with prank after prank after prank, what more could you ask for than for someone to turn those pranks into punchlines? Look, all I'm saying is this present, our present, is not the future we all hoped it would be. That's why I'm, I'm just really focusing on living in the present, really working hard to live in the present. And right now, in the present, I just finished taping my special. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.